This is After Immunity, a UMFM limited series that aims to explore the questions surrounding what our individual and collective worlds will look like after we've gained immunity to COVID-19. Join me, Ian T.D. Thompson, as we explore five topics to understand the post-COVID-19 world. On today's episode, we are looking at Canada's local art scenes after immunity. Join us as we talk with Debbie Warner, Executive Director of the Toronto Jewish Film Festival, and Faye Thompson, a co-director and co-founder of the professional program for the School of Contemporary Dancers in Winnipeg. The last live show I attended was in March of 2020. I wasn't crazy about it. While the band was decent, the singer left more to be desired. However, as I watched this performance in an old theater on the east side of Toronto, I couldn't help but appreciate the community it brought out. With their beers in hand, awkwardly holding their winter coats, one can't help but appreciate that connectivity that only the local art scene can create. We've all had an experience like this, that last live show, gathering, conference, or art gallery we attended before we locked down into quarantine. Today's show is an homage to that last live, in-person event we experienced. Now, many local art scenes have continued throughout the pandemic, but the arts we've experienced have looked and quite possibly felt different. Shows, festivals, and exhibits have moved to an online format. What would normally be larger-than-life events, like the Toronto Caribbean Festival, were placed into the confines of a home screen viewing. Secondly, where you experience the arts has also changed. Not only has your living room been the venue for film and album premieres, but throughout the pandemic we have also seen established venues that have served the community across Canada for decades close their doors. This has included Winnipeg's Garrick Centre and Toronto's Orbit Room. Over 80 have shut their doors with many more in precarious financial situations. Artists and organizers in the sector have also been directly impacted by the pandemic. According to Statistics Canada, employment in the arts, entertainment and recreation sector in January has continued to fall in 2021, down 38% from January of last year. Lastly, and a little bit more positively, some artists have used this time to produce more content and less time touring for extended periods. This has opened up questions around the sustainability of the touring lifestyle. Thus, the pandemic has changed many different elements of the sector, including how viewers engage with the local arts and how and if artists and organizers convey their craft. Now, governments are aware of the negative impacts of the pandemic on the arts. We have seen new supports by different levels of government to help the sector, including $181 million by the federal government to support live arts and music. However, there are still questions of how this will manifest for both the artists and audience. How will local Canadian art scenes transform in that post-COVID-19 world? How will we engage with local arts in that future? Will we still go to shows or the theatre in the way we did before or with the same frequency? Additionally, will new trends and innovations produced during the pandemic help the scene evolve for the better after immunity? To kick off this discussion is Debbie Warner, the executive director of the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. The festival was one of the first in Canada to transition from an in-person to online festival when faced with the challenges of the pandemic in June of 2020. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So obviously today we're talking about the local arts scene, how it will transform, but I think a good place to start is to talk about the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. And can you describe to our listeners what the mandate of the Toronto Jewish Film Festival is and how did the festival first come into existence? Okay, so it's actually the Toronto Jewish Film Foundation that is really the parent organization that presents the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. Okay. We came about in 1993, was the first festival, and it was featured 14 films that were presented over five days at one venue. And we have, over the years, grown to being the largest presenter of Jewish content film in Canada and the largest, one of the largest cultural events in the Jewish communities across Canada. And we are now going into our 29th year. And while it will not yet be a normal year, for a normal year, we would normally be looking at a festival that would be screening at around seven or eight venues across the GTA. We would be looking at around 100 films from Canada and around the world, welcoming over 25,000 
people through the door. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Again, it's very interesting. It sounds like a very just interesting history of how it's developed. And I think an important aspect of that history is what happened last year with the 2020 festival. And obviously the pandemic has placed a lot of restrictions on theaters, and it certainly changed how your organization had to function last year. Of course, the festival moved online. It was in two parts, May, June, and October, November. In your own words, how did the pandemic changed the festival in 2020. What were kind of the changes you had to make to make it function in the middle of a pandemic? Well, so at the point that we went into lockdown about mid-March last year, we were, plants were like beyond well underway for our 2020 festival. We had our lineup in place. Negotiations were starting with the film distributors to lock in the titles, to firm up the plans. And we were really happy with the way the festival was coming along. And then all of a sudden, everything ground to an immediate halt. We were really fortunate. Our director of programming, Jeremy Abasira, did not waste a moment trying to figure out how we were going to salvage all of the work that had been done to that point. And um, we really hated to see the line of go to waste. And we worked towards, at Jeremy's, through hard research, fast research, towards being able to pivot to an online festival. We felt very beholden to our community, to the donors, to the sponsors, to, to deliver the annual festival as expected. And I think, probably at the point that we all went into lockdown, I don't think any of us perhaps understood how long we were locking down for. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like a challenge that we were up to taking on. The truth was that we really didn't have any idea how to how to go about any of this. We didn't know if film distributors were going to be able to work with us. Would we be able to develop the viewing platform that would work successfully for viewers at home? Would we be able to integrate a viewing platform with our box office? Would audiences be receptive to an online festival? And really importantly, would we be able to afford to do this and they were all unknowns and that was all part of the decision that we made to take our lineup and split it over two deliveries so kind of i'm appreciating that we were we were forging into new territory and feeling our way as we went that we were on a very big learning curve so the idea was to try to do it to do it but to do it as responsibly as we could so to start off with the spring edition make sure that it worked for everyone, make sure it was something that was actually the festival could afford to do, mm -hmm. and then tweak and improve and move on to the fall. And that's pretty much what we did. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting just because, as you said, Ontario and, and a lot of parts in Canada really locked down in, in March. And, and here you are as a festival in May, June. You kind of were the first, one of the yeah. first, or were we you? Do you? We were. Okay. We did not know that at that. We had no idea mm -hmm. at the time that we were the first. We found out afterwards because as soon as we announced and we were able to announce, so we locked down, I think it was like March 14th, 15th, something around there. And we announced the online festival by the beginning of April, the first week of April. Oh, wow. And the phone started ringing from other festivals in the city, across the country, outside of the country. What were we doing? How were we doing it? Mm -hmm. And we, at that point, we really had no idea that we were the first community festival to go online. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's an achievement or in some ways the biggest risk because you took on the biggest risk as the first online yeah. festival. There were actually, I shouldn't say we were the, there were a couple outside of Canada that had started mm -hmm. in the States. I think that there was, there were one or two that were already underway as, as well. Yeah, but still but one yeah, of the first. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were one of the first. And I think probably it was probably a good thing that we didn't understand that we were kind of quite a new territory that we were biting off. Now look at a year later, everybody that can be there is there now, right? Like we really see that we have a very full online arts and culture presence that's happening. I'm really glad you mentioned that just because I, I want to just talk about the viewers themselves because mm -hmm. you have the festival, but on the other side, you always have the viewers and those that engage with the festival, those that are interested in it. In your view, looking back, how did the pandemic change how viewers engaged uh, with the festival? Were there any new audiences that came to the festival? Yeah, for sure. So with our spring festival, we were all facing like huge flux and huge change. Everybody, we were all in shelter in place orders and 
our goal was really to try to replicate the feel of the festival. Distributors hadn't been approached yet by community festivals. So at the time we were negotiating, it was really just like working for transitioning what we would normally do, presenting a festival in the GTA. We were really just presenting again, trying to present in the GTA online. For our fall festival, we realized that there was actually the opportunity to try to offer our programming to more than just the GTA. And we were able to work with the distributors and not just the distributors, but also the other smaller Jewish film festivals in Ontario who we wanted to be very respectful of Mm -hmm. and cognizant of to service their communities as well and to service communities that never had festival programming before. Mm -hmm. So that was a bonus, right, to be able to to do that. And I'm already losing track of where the question was that you have. I could ramble on on a bunch of things, but maybe you want to steer me back in where. Yeah, well, it's just like, yeah, it's the idea that it sounds like you were able to kind of expand the viewership, folks that can engage with the festival. It was a big difference between the spring festival and the fall festival for the industry and for the public. Mm -hmm. So for the industry, they had to figure out what it meant to be providing viewing windows for online festivals as opposed to screening rights for an in-theater. And that kind of came underway over the process between the the spring and the fall. For the viewers, they were also on the learning curve. We all had to learn how to get a little more acquainted with our technology at home. And we worked really hard to try to take our viewers through it as we were learning how to do it. So our festival, you were able to watch our festival and all of our programming that we continue to do online using your computer or a mobile device, but you can also watch on your television. We've had apps built with Roku and with Apple TV, you can Chromecast, you can connect an HDMI cable. Some people, when you say these things go, oh yeah, I know what you mean. And some people Mm -hmm. ask you, what are you talking about? (laughs) So uh, we, we, we worked hard to try to develop a means of taking an audience that was used to showing up at a theater, sitting down in a seat. Mm -hmm. Now how to configure their at home viewing preferences so that they, we could try again to replicate as close as possible, the experience of the festival. We made how to videos, we put instructions on, we held info sessions, we sent out a test film, we made a a test film available prior to the festival so that people could get themselves set up and ready prior to the festival so that when it began, they would be able to comfortably watch. And we ran tech support. We ran it. We hired a group of very patient people to to work with our viewers, kind of leading up to the festival and throughout the festival. Mm -hmm. In preparing for this interview, you go to the website and you're absolutely right. You know, there's clear instructions on how to do it on every platform imaginable. But clear is a really relative term when you say that, so. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, right? yeah. It's a question of will my parents be able to figure it out? And that's yeah. is something I had to figure out yesterday for sure. I want to just take this conversation and maybe take it up a little bit higher in sure. kind of the idea of accessibility. You mm-hmm. have this new online service delivery model, you're very practically putting it in place for the festival in 2020, but kind of just thinking more generally, again, very future oriented. How do you think that this new online service delivery model will kind of affect accessibility of your content in the post COVID-19 world? Right. So we built or had developed in order to host our festivals, what we call the TGFF virtual cinema. And we developed this out of necessity, but I believe we will continue to use this virtual cinema long after Mm. this is behind us. The pandemic is behind us because for some people, it proved to be a more accessible and convenient means of participating in our programming. What we learned through the virtual programming is that it breaks down a lot of barriers that people had, be they geography, mobility, time, economics, Mm -hmm. even. It allowed us to deliver programming to areas that never had programming before. It provided people with the convenience of being able to watch within a viewing window for a film, but when they wanted there were no lineups, there was no traffic to deal with, there were no outrageous parking fees. Mm -hmm. So for some people, 
they really preferred this. You didn't have to dress up. You didn't even have to get dressed to attend the festival. (laughs) And so I think that there were some real benefits for some. Mm -hmm. There were definite, listen, having said that, I really miss the shared experience of watching a film with an audience. I definitely miss the theater popcorn and the sense of being together and part of something together when we're at the festival. But I think that the online programming definitely has its benefits as well. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you mentioned the theater experience because Mm -hmm. right now discussions in kind of the, both the local art scenes as well as just in general, as this pandemic goes on, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of discussion about what things are going to stick after this pandemic. Will people be heading back to the theater at the same rate as before? Or will things like premium video on demand, where you have these large scale blockbusters on various streaming sites, that's the launch. In your view, do you think we will go back to that status quo? Or will there be longer lasting changes in how we consume local arts and culture in the post COVID-19 world? I'm hoping that we will see a return to something that is a a recognizable version of normal for us. And I am hoping that we will go back to theaters will survive. Listen, I work in the nonprofit arts sector. Most of the arts take place in that sector. It is precarious at the best of times and that we really, in order to sustain ourselves, to thrive, to do what we do, we rely on the support of our communities, of public funders. We rely on people valuing the arts as part of their lives. So yes, I hope that we are able to return to the theaters and able to support Mm -hmm. the theaters again and to meet again, you know, and for all the wonderful things that I've said, about the online programming, for some, this has still remained an isolating experience, right? They, it probably makes a difference whether you're home watching alone or you're with your family on the, you know, who's on the couch with you when you're watching, Mm -hmm. right? And certainly one area, like I said before, we've tried really hard to replicate in our online programming the feel of the festival. Festivals have an energy to them. They have a flow and excitement about them. We tried very hard in the way that we laid out the festivals to replicate that. You know, we didn't go with the Netflix model of just dumping all the films on the platform at once and you watch them when you want. We released films each day so that we generated a little buzz and excitement for what a new day, what was in store for you each day. We were able to keep interaction with our audiences in place by hosting live Q&As. But at the same time, there were things that were definitely missed. Audiences connected through us over Zoom, not with each other in the same respect. And one area that we have not been able to figure out how to manage online is the whole area of the 150 to 180 volunteers that were part of the festival every year that lend so much flavor and warmth to a festival that for them, this was a social activity, um, an annual experience that so many of them participated in, faces we looked forward to seeing part of the team year after year. Mm -hmm. Those things don't get replaced by this online world. And those things, I think, have a lot of value for a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you brought up the concept of community because I think something that we haven't talked about is the idea that throughout this pandemic, a number of long established arts and culture institutions because of pandemic restrictions had to ultimately close their doors. Kind of tied to this idea, the community. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on how the scene will recover after immunization in this post COVID-19 world? Well, I'm hoping that when we all return back to a, hopefully a lot of what we've, the things that we have lost that we want back, maybe some things we don't want back, but the things that we want back after this world, that people won't forget how the arts helped them get through this period of unprecedented challenge, that we saw a lot of creativity despite the circumstances that we found ourselves in isolated at home, we saw a lot of innovation and a lot of resilience from the nonprofit art sector. And a sector, as I said before, that really faces precarious employment at the best of times. 
And I'm really hoping that people remember how the films and the books and the music and the dance that they experienced at home during this time, how it helped to lift our spirits, how it sustained us and comforted us, just past the time, it educated us, it entertained us. And I think it kept people feeling vital when there was often, I know for me, there's often been a feeling of helplessness through this, that as individuals, what can we do outside of staying home, wearing masks, distancing, all of those things. So I'm really hoping that people when it is a safe world and people are comfortable and ready to come out of their homes, that they really will continue to support and protect the arts organizations that they hold dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like seeing the the value that local arts and culture has given back to right. the community during this time. Debbie, this is, of course, a forward-looking mm -hmm. limited series. And of course, one aspect of being forward-looking is looking forward to what the 2021 uh, Toronto Jewish Film Festival has to offer. What, what can viewers uh, look forward to with the 2021 festival? So our 29th edition will be taking place June 3rd to 13th this year. The plans are well underway right now. Our programming committee are working hard on coming up with the lineup. We are continuing to plan with the safety and comfort of audiences in mind. So while we hope that the world will be moving towards in the coming months towards some safe opportunities to leave our homes. Mm -hmm. We are also planning that we will be programming online again. And that programming will include all of the wonderful things that people have come to expect over the years from TGFF. It's gonna be fantastic films from Canada and around the world, great Q and A's with filmmakers, panel discussions, special events. Hopefully we will, we continue to innovate as we go, look for new opportunities and collaborations to work with other community and arts organizations and to share the expertise and the wealth of riches that the arts sector has to offer. So we hope to make that all part of the 29th Toronto Jewish Film Festival. That sounds terrific. That sounds very exciting. And we certainly wish you wish you all the support in, in seeing how, if we can see it in theaters, but it sounds like you got a pretty good online service delivery model now tested, I guess you could say. We do. And, and I have to say, it's not just a festival that we offer. We have online programming that is going on all the time. We have a pretty full roster for the coming months. So if I can give a little shout out right now for... Some of our programming, our festival programming, is unfortunately only available in Ontario. But we also have an online streaming platform that is accessible and free for all viewers across Canada. It's called JFlix, and it's available at j-flix.com. We add new titles weekly, and it is where we showcase favorite films from our past festivals. Mm -hmm. So I encourage anyone that is looking for some wonderful films and looking for a little change from their usual streaming platforms to check it out. Oh, sure. Go to that, jflix.com. That sounds great. Debbie, we really appreciate the time and being able to hear your, your thoughts, your experiences from the pandemic, as well as just your perspective on where you think all of this is headed. Do you have any concluding thoughts on the future of the art scenes in Canada in general after immunization? I think that when I am hoping that when we are all vaccinated, when it is safe to come out of our home, that we will be able to celebrate that accomplishment through the arts. I think that there is going to be a real hunger for people to get up and move, to be back in the places that made them happy before the pandemic. And you know, one thing about this lockdown is we've probably all come to really be able to identify the theaters, the music halls, the bookstores, the coffee shops, the places outside of our homes that maybe we just took for granted before, but now we really know that we want back in our lives. And I'm hoping that the art scene across Canada remains strong and robust and has the opportunity and the support behind it to flourish and to make a recovery. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to, to end off. Debbie, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure speaking with you.
Welcome back to After Immunity. My name is Ian T.D. Thompson. That was Virgo Rising, but their track Molly Ringwald Dances in the Front Row. That was from their 2021 album release, 16th Sapphire. Debbie raised some interesting thoughts on how the festival weathered the pandemic and how the scene might evolve in the future. The online format was a blessing in disguise and new methods and technologies allowed the show to go on. Now, it wasn't perfect. The shared experience that comes from a grand in-person festival was lost, but the format did have the benefit of making the festival more accessible, reducing the barriers of geography, time, and economics for some event goers. While in-person events will certainly return, an online presence will live on after immunity, meeting the needs of those currently not served by the live model. After the interview, Debbie mentioned something that I found interesting. She describes some works of art like castles in the sand. That is, some art is expressed within the present moment, a single live performance rather than a pre-recorded medium. Additionally, it is important to note that as a film festival, they dealt with screens before the pandemic hit. Thus, an online format where films are played on phones, computers, or TV sets could translate more readily. But what about parts of the local art scene that didn't deal with pre-recorded film or the video format before the lockdowns? What about those forms of art that are more like castles in the sand, that are expressed through a single, non-repeatable live performance? How have they weathered this pandemic, and how might they evolve in the post-COVID-19 world? To explore some of these queries, we now delve into the art of dance. Faye Thompson is the co-director and co-founder of the professional program of the School of Contemporary Dancers in Winnipeg. Faye, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. So I guess just to kind of kick us off a little bit, for those that might be unfamiliar with the school, can you describe to the listeners the objective of the school and what sort of programs and services it offers? Sure. Our school is known as one of the leading centers for professional contemporary dance training in Canada. So there's a few schools across Canada that are funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage federally as a national center of excellence for training, in this case, in contemporary dance. They also fund for other art forms as well. And we're also funded by the Manitoba Arts Council and Winnipeg Arts Council. And our mandate is to produce professional dancers for our local, national, and international contemporary dance community. And our graduates are across the country and across the world. And uh, we also have an evening program, a junior professional program for high school students that are preparing for our post-secondary program, our professional program. And we also have a general program for community outreach for the student that might want to study once a week. So the center of the school is the professional program. It's affiliated with the University of Winnipeg and students can attain a degree as well as a conservatory training. So it sounds like there's quite a number of different services programs that the school is able to offer. And it sounds like produces the dancers that we might see at the national, international level. That's terrific. So The series as a whole is talking about that post-pandemic future and what kind of lies ahead. But I guess it's, you can't kind of start from that position. You got to start with what's going on currently and the pandemic that we're facing right now as we talk over this Zoom call. How has the pandemic and the restrictions affected those programs that you just described for us and your ability in administering the school? I think for all the performing arts organization, it's been an absolutely crazy year because instead of creating one season, everybody is creating a new season and a new season and a new season as we pivot with all the different rises and falls of the wave of the pandemic. So it's interesting. You have to be very agile and you have to be ready to pivot in any direction at any moment. So for us, the way we prepared to be able to do that is we have a hybrid model that we're working with so that we can be totally in the studio if that everything restrictions were totally released we could be totally online if there's a surge of the pandemic and we can also blend the online and the in studio if needed so it's it's been not unique to us either every artistic director that i've spoken to is it's um it's uh we're 
responding with agility in every moment, I would say, mm -hmm. and not just us, but I just hear it right across the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that, as you said, you kind of have that hybrid model prepared at any instance for how things might change over the course of weeks, months, days even. Insofar as that kind of model goes, these steps that you've taken, is this something you, you think you'd be able to maintain in the long term? Or is this kind of a short-term Band-Aid solution? Well, I would say it could be both. In the short term, the hybrid model allows us to address any restrictions. And also, it's very important to us to keep these students safe. So at all points, we have to be ready to respond. And then some elements in the program, it's interesting. We found that having an online element in some cases was interesting and might be something that we might keep. But on the other hand, some elements definitely need an in-studio component, a strong in-studio component. So there are elements that have been revealed as interesting and intriguing in the current situation that I think that's true of a lot of the performing arts organizations. And then there's other elements that need to return to the in-studio, the in-theater aspect as being fundamental to the nature of the art form. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, just in the sense of that online format, what works and in what aspects does it work? And I want to talk about that in terms of kind of the trends you've seen and the way that things have moved around. So the school itself has engaged in both online shows as well as outside shows earlier in the pandemic when restrictions weren't as, as tight, you could say. How do you feel about those approaches, about the online format as well as the outside format? How do you think those shows went? Well, um, even in terms of the training, the online has been very important in the sense that there are certain subjects that can be presented well online. So we have a dance legacy course that could be presented well online. We have a music course. We were able to present that online very well. We had even partnering lectures with a very renowned national artist, Sylvain Lafortune, who did a partnering lecture series that worked beautifully online. We've also drawn on the online in that we have out-of-province guests always every year, many out-of-province guests that come in. Many of them cannot come in now, but they can come online and they can do their creative process through the online and it would not otherwise be possible to engage them. We have, if students have even the mildest symptom of illness, if they have a runny nose, if they have a cough, they can't come in until they're cleared medically. So they can be online and do class and take part if they feel well enough to do that. And we've also had international students because we have students from across the world as well as across Canada that come into the program. So we've had students that have been online doing classes and rehearsals, waiting for safe travel into Canada. So the online component has actually been very important in terms of operating within this year. Mm -hmm. And in terms of performance itself, what we did for our December performance series, we had to move online for three weeks in November when cases surged. Because we're a post-secondary program, we weren't required legally to do so, but we felt the cases were such that, that it was a prudent thing to do. So we went online and came into the theater in January instead of December. And by January, we were able to bring the dancers into the theater and in very small groups, social distancing, masks on. They've learned to dance with masks on and film each of their pieces in a very safe environment. And then that's being compiled and it will be presented as an online performance. So, and we're not unique in that. A lot of the arts organizations are, dance organizations are presenting their performances online. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting in the sense that there has certainly been an interest in filming and presenting online, but this has accelerated the focus on that way of delivery. At the same time, there is a hunger on the part of the performers and the audience to come together in the live interchange synergy that happens when we have live performance. And that I don't think will ever change. It will continue to be important to have that coming together in live presentation in the performing arts. So I think it's catapulted the development of presenting online. I think it will continue. I think it's brought out some interesting things artistically that people have investigated. At the same time, in person, audience there, performers there, the magical interchange, nothing can replace that. 
Mm -hmm. That provides a really helpful perspective, I think, in terms of what's worked and what hasn't worked. So it really sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, that the online format and certain aspects of teaching online might be still seen as something incorporated into how you teach dance moving forward, even past the pandemic. Would that be fair to say? I would say there's certain subjects that might be considered maybe more academic subjects that can be presented well online. Mm -hmm. And there are also the students, we brought in courses that gave the students new skills in how to film their own creative processes and how to put a compile a presentation online. Mm. So there's new skills that they've actually learned that we brought into the program this year that everybody's very excited about and that we will carry for it into next year. But in terms of training, there's nothing that will replace having that interaction of the teacher, the rehearsal director in the studio, the interchange with the dancer, because it's such a physical, tactile art form that it's vital to have that interchange in the long term, in terms of the development of the future dancer and performing artist. So some things, it's interesting, some things have been discovered, and I don't think that's unique to us. And then, of course, some of it is ways of delivering and continuing to move forward until we can return to where we ultimately will need to be. Again, that's really interesting to me that there seems to be some innovations happening in terms of how dance is communicated, actually, or expressed, and that switch to an online or a screen-based format seems to be one of them. So earlier in this topic, we've talked to a film festival and how they've had to move online, and yet the transition has been more or less, for better or for worse, they've been able to make that transition because they dealt with screens before. Insofar as what you just talked about, about teaching the students how to communicate or film the dance, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, about how dance might be evolving into that sort of the screen-based mediums. How has that played out? And do you think that's something we're going to see more into the future? The way it occurred within our program is we brought in where we had an international guest artist. She paired up with a videographer. So the two of them together were working with the dancers. So while they were looking at aspects of creating their own compositions, they were also learning skills in terms of how to record what they were doing and even how to explore the creation from certain viewpoints, given what they were discovering within the work with the videographer. Mm -hmm. So that certainly has been a discovery. And we just finished another process where, again, a dance artist that works within film a lot has been brought in to work with another artist. We have Susie Burpee from Toronto working with our students right now on a composition process. And she's partnering with one of her longtime dance partners, Linnea Swan in Calgary. And Linnea's had extensive work in film, in dance, and the two of them are partnering together. So it's a new exploration, I think, for all of us. It's certainly been there. It's not that there hasn't been film and there hasn't been online, but it's suddenly catapulted to a new level of importance. And I think that that will continue, but there will definitely be the return to the live performance experience. There's, mm-hmm. there's no replacing that kind of experience like that. That is, a, And you can feel it in the dancers and in the audience that people want to come together again and they want to have that interchange. So mm-hmm. I think... Both things will happen going forward. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit more to those aspects that aren't able to be replaced online. Because as I said, you know, we talked to a film festival about this and it's a movie. That is its original medium in how it communicates artistic expression. Whereas dance is, as you said, you know, it's in a theater and, and that's how people have traditionally gone to see contemporary dancers. So I was wondering if you might be able to explain a little bit more about what might make dance different from the other mediums in the local art scene and what can and can't be communicated online. Right. Well, first of all, in training itself, if you're in a performing arts form, and certainly in dance, within the studio, there's a kind of level of coaching that happens that you, it's very difficult to do on a Zoom format or, or another online format. And that would be where you're wanting, first of all, to demonstrate in a full space, uh, the kind of movement call to you want. You want to move in and and have some tactile interaction in terms of refinement of technique. And the immediacy of the interchange allows for elegant detailing in the technique and artistry of the dancer. So that kind of interchange 
at that depth is not possible in the long term mm -hmm. in an online format. The bigger picture you could deal with in the online format, but delving in and getting into the depth of the experience and the depth of the training can only happen really once you're in the studio. And then in terms of live performance, I think it's not unique to dance, but I think in live performance, there's, well, we actually even see it in sports. Like mm. the, we have sports events happening where they're in a stadium or they're in an arena and they miss the fact that they have their, the spectators there. So, and it's the same really in the performing arts. It's the artist is interacting with the audience and the audience is really interacting with the performer in a live performance event. So that aspect adds a whole nother layer to what's taking place. And that's something that needs to have that coming together to happen. Yeah. And those are the sort of elements that we might see return in that post-COVID world. Would that be fair to say? Oh, yes. Yes. I think there's no doubt that I think there might even be an explosion of live performances after we're all vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, yes, mm -hmm. I, I think I don't think that means that the intriguing interest that's come in terms of exploring the online aspect of working within the arts will dissipate. But I think there will be almost an explosive return to a live performance. Yeah. Both for the artists and the and the audiences alike, you could even say. So one aspect that I found interesting in exploring this topic has kind of been an analogy of the arts and seeing the arts as like castles in the sand sometimes where it's presented or pieces are presented, they're performed, and sometimes they're forgotten. And one of the trends we've seen with some arts groups or some film festivals, some mediums, has been utilizing past archived performances to engage with audiences. Has this been a technique incorporated by the school, or, or do you have any thoughts on that incorporation of past events and materials in the, the post-COVID-19 world? In terms of the school, the works that we mount are, there's a variety of ways that works are mounted. One is that they're created in the moment for the group that's there. Another way that's done is they're remounted from archives of works that have been done. So with the choreographer's permission and the choreographer facilitating, it could be a remount and therefore it could be something that comes from the archives and has that kind of legacy. Or there could be a blend of the two of those things where somebody is inspired by something they've done before, but they want to create it in a new uh, new life. Mm -hmm. So all those things are possible. And I think there's beauty in both. Because with visual art, we don't look at a painting once and then throw it out because we've seen it, then that's the end of it. So there is a beauty in revisiting and exploring in our observation more depth in terms of what we're experiencing. At the same time, there's a beauty and it's something that is temporary just in that moment. And even though a uh, performance might be videoed and recorded, whatever happens in that live performance is really unique to that moment. And that makes it very special mm -hmm. and precious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like how you articulated that. I think that's a, that's a great way to sum up a little bit of the different elements of, of art and why we appreciate art, I think. I kind of want to switch directions a little bit and talk about supports of the local arts and a little bit of the recovery of dance, you could say. So you mentioned kind of on the onset regarding the school itself and the supports it receives from government and arts-based associations. And they are important to that long-term prosperity of the local art scene. What role would you like to see these associations, government play in the local art scenes in Canada after the pandemic is over? Where do they fit in that world, do you think? In terms of the national arts training programs, we were very fortunate that along with the professional companies, we were all given an emergency 25% increase in our operating funding, a one-year increase to deal with the emergencies around the pandemic. And that was true of our programs that are funded by Canadian Heritage and the companies that are funded by the Canada Council for the Arts. So that was a tremendous thing that was initiated and they made it very simple. It was the first time ever that I personally have had a simple grant application ever. <laughs> and so they made it very easy and the money came very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was tremendous. What we are currently asking is that they consider extending that emergency funding, not just our program, 
But what's being asked across the country in terms of the Canada Arts Training Fund that we're funded by, that this, this emergency funding be extended into the next season because we'll be in recovery phase. So it won't be immediately we can go from zero to 100 in terms of economic resources. So the hope is that would be extended into another year. And then ultimately, there is a request to consider further funding to address all the areas. There's a variety of areas to be addressed in the Canada Arts Training Fund under Canadian Heritage. We also have accessed the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, and that has been a tremendous asset to us. And we are hearing to other arts organizations as well. So that's been very significant. And the other thing is we have accessed money along with other organizations from the Winnipeg Foundation in order to purchase many things that we require to operate safely, like sanitizers and HEPA filter air purifiers mm -hmm. and a whole long list of numerous things that had to be implemented. So we would have layer upon layer upon layer of safety measures. So that came from the Winnipeg Foundation. So we, we have been very appreciative of that support. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, yeah, the way they can help is be able to assist in the recovery while you deal with the challenges you faced from the pandemic. In light of that, in light of those challenges, this is a rather general question, but I think we've been talking about it throughout this interview. How do you see the, the dance scene and the profession itself recovering and evolving in Canada because of this pandemic? Is it now kind of going on a different trajectory, you could say? I would say yes and no. Okay. I would say there are new elements coming into play, and that's going to be a gift that came out of this crazy time. At the same time, I think there will be a resurgence of returning to many of the things that we've all valued all the way along and a celebration of that return. So I think both things will happen. Faye, we're nearing the end of the questions here, but I was wondering, do you have any final thoughts in regards to the local arts scene, how, how it might evolve in the post-COVID-19 world? Um, what I would say is I have great hope for the future because it's been amazing how creative everyone has been. There's been a tremendous amount of creativity in responding very quickly to a changing circumstances. And I see that right across, across Canada. And I think it's a testament to the creativity of the arts organizations. So I'm not sure exactly in detail where we're, we are all going, but I have great hope for the future. Faye, that's, I think that's a, it's a hopeful way to kind of end things off here. Faye, thank you so much for your time being able to talk to us about the local arts scene as it pertains to, to the medium of dance. It was, it was a very insightful conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Today, we have heard two different perspectives from Canada's local art scenes. Faye made reference to the considerable challenges that the school faced both as a teaching institution as well as a live arts company. While online and video skills have become more prominent in response to the quarantine and may have value particularly in teaching even after the pandemic, one might characterize it more as a necessary evil to ensure continuation of the school's operations. This is in contrast to the Toronto Jewish Film Festival, where the online format was and continues to be a blessing in disguise, an opportunity to increase accessibility of their audience. Despite differences, there were a few overarching similarities in what was said. First was a hope and desire that we will see rejuvenation in the live performance. Driven by a hunger from both the artists and audience, we may see an explosion of performances in Canada. As I said on the onset of today's episode, one can't help but appreciate the community connectivity that only the local art scene can create. That sense of community will return after immunity. Additionally, this rejuvenation will be coupled with a greater appreciation of what the local arts have provided us throughout this pandemic. Whether it is music, film, visual art, or dance, art has kept us inspired, encouraged, and engaged during this time. As Thomas Merton puts it, art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. After immunity, we will appreciate the local art scenes that much more. Thank you for listening to After Immunity. A big thanks to Debbie Warner and Faye Thompson for coming on today's episode. Tune in next week as we discuss mental health in the post-COVID-19 world. 
Host and executive producer is myself, Ian T.D. Thompson. Associate producers are Neil Kramer and Jonah Coatser. After Immunity is a UMFM 101.5 limited series broadcasted out of the University of Manitoba. For more information on the series, visit umfm.com. If you have any thoughts or comments on the series or anything you heard on today's episode, email us at after.immunity at umfm.com. 